your world is now officially part of D&D. You have a new book coming out, which is called The Explorer's Guide to Wildmount. This is huge. This is crazy. Can you, uh, can you tell me about what's in the book and also what it feels like to have this come together? Yeah, uh, I'll start with how it feels. That's this is insane. Still, um, I'm still processing it. It feels doesn't feel real yet. Um, you know, D and D is such a huge part of my life. Role playing games um, are what made me today. And so to to be have the opportunity to to collaborate with wizards and and bring this world that kind of just came from here um, to an official guide like this and and invite people to make what they want of it is is incredible. And I, I don't I think it'll be a while before it really sinks in. Right now, I'm still very much like in the hope people like it. Uh, I was thinking about things I probably should have done in the book. I don't know. You know, it's it's I, my chaotic brain, um, but it's 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 meant to be both you know for fans of Critical Role, but for people who have never watched an episode. It's it's an entirely new setting to set an entire campaign or more in. Um, it's a breakdown of the entire continent of Wild Mountain, Alexandria. Uh, that includes the history and the myth, the creation myth of the world. It, inc it inc uh, includes the whole entire pantheon as well as lesser idols, entities that aren't quite gods but exist in a you know above mortal space within the realm. It goes into uh, the the factions and societies, the larger and major factions and societies that make up Wildmount. Um, and then it goes into a, a deep gazetteer about all the major locations throughout the entire continent, what's there, um, as well as uh, what. You know, sort of geography elements are surrounding various locations and cityscapes. Uh, it goes into plot hooks for a lot of these locations as well to help inspire DMs uh, who want to run sessions and adventures in those specific regions. And then we go into character options, which has breakdowns of all the different major races of Exandria and where they fit in different locations and cultures there to kind of help you feel like you take the D&D races and how they culturally fit within Wildmount. Then that goes into character options, which include three new subclasses that are based around Dunamancy, which is this mysterious new form of magic that has been uh, developed by the Korean dynasty that involves like you know space and time and gravity and, and entropy and a lot of those unique elements of kind of metaphysical space talk that I'm really fascinated with. Um, when there we have a bunch of new spells in Dunamancy that are available, and then we have this really cool thing called the Heroic Chronicle, which is uh, a way of creating a character's backstory through tables and dice or choosing and essentially a really easy way to build a character's background within Wild Mountain feel deeply ingrained and assimilated with the cultures there right out of the gate. Um, and then we go into, I mean, there's a lot in this book. Yeah, uh, it's, it's a very, very packed book. It's <laughs> very crunchy, but with like lots of story as well. Yeah, I, I wanted to make sure there was something there for everybody. Um, you know, critical fans and not. And uh, we go in there into an, an adventure chapter, which has four starting adventures to get a, a party from levels one to three, uh, each one in, in one of the four major regions of Wildmount. That way you can start a campaign really in, in any major place in the continent and kind of get you started in that space. Um, they're all very unique and have their own feel and flavor to them. Uh, then we have a bunch of new magical items, as well as artifacts. Uh, for those who are familiar with the show, especially our first campaign, there are the Vestiges of Divergence. They're uh, magical items that were created before the Calamity, this giant battle that sundered the world. And uh, the Divergence was when the gods left the, the Prime Material Plane. And so these, these items that were left over from the time have largely gone dormant. And so they're in a dormant state. Is they're, they're you know, a decent magical item. And then as a character grows, moments of strong character growth or... Uh, emotional intensity can trigger them to exalt, you know, or you know, to to awaken into a, into a, a more powerful state, and so they grow with the character, and then eventually exalt into a uh, their most powerful form, which is a high level artifact. Um, so th there's a number of new vestiges of divergence in the book that are catered towards uh, Wild Mount and some of the elements there, uh, and then we get to expand from there into new creatures. We have a bunch of new. Monsters, uh, you know, I'm elements. A fan, I'm a fan of new monsters. <laughs> There's a lot, lot of fun stuff in there that that's specific to elements of the campaign that people have watched the campaign too, as well as new creatures that are specific to the Wild Mount Continent, and uh, I'm excited about that. There is a ton in this book. <laughs> like you're right, there really is something for everyone. Like I hope so, <laughs> you're getting spells, you're getting monsters, you, you're getting artifacts, you're getting adventures in there, and you're getting some new subclasses on top of all of that. That's that's a that's a 
big book. This is going to be a big book. I, th I think I got the note from Wizards saying, uh, if, if we end up doing another one, it doesn't have to be as much. <laughs> <laughs> I, got a, I got a little overzealous. Um, and uh, I think that's just because it's my first time doing something like this officially with them, and I want to you know, make it special, and I want to make people excited about it. I don't want to let anyone down. There's also a lot of art from the community itself, correct? Like, correct, there, yeah. This is like, I mean, because art is a fundamental part of D&D. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, so, so you have tons of art in this. Tell yes. me about that. Uh, really excited. Because Critical Role uh, and our, our community is, is so in incredible and so talented, we look for as many opportunities as we can to, to bring other people in on anything we do, to raise them up, to, to give them opportunity, to, to you know, include them in, in things we do. And Wizards was so gracious in letting me uh, push for artists within our community that do a lot of our fan art and include them as part of this project. So we were able to, to take a large swath of, of, of our artists and send them to Wizards and be like, please pick from these individuals. And so together we were able to, to essentially take, I, I think the math is right, about half the art in the book comes directly from the Critical Role community. All artists that for the most part had never worked with Wizards before. And so it's been really amazing to see one how seamlessly it blends with all these incredible artists that have already been seen in a number of D&D of &D books, um, but also to feel like a part of our community has contributed to bring this world to life. Uh, and I'm, I'm super proud and super excited to have had everybody on board for it. And, and this is like the first universe to join D&D &D since Eberron that I'm aware of. You might be right. Yeah. Oh no! It's huge. Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, it's crazy. Put pressure That's on crazy. <laughs> no, no, no. It's wild. Um, yeah. Like I said, this is all still sinking in. It's surreal. How do you try to inspire uh, fans of Critical Role to play D and D? Now that this book is out, you've given them a lot more tools to get into Dungeons and Dragons. But also, this book is very much. Perfect for someone who is an old school D and D player. At the same time, like how how do you encourage both? Uh, but especially critters who are like a little nervous, maybe about getting into tabletop. But I've always watched you play, mm -hmm. um, and and you set a very high standard of play, as well. Uh, it for one, I for people who have watched the show and have you know followed our stories and adventures. A lot of times, the challenge and the anxiety with starting to play is starting to Dungeon Master. Um, running a game is a very intimidating thing if you don't really know at first what you're, what you're trying to accomplish or what world to play it in. You know, if you're doing it on a module, it's still having to learn what that world is about and trying to absorb and understand the world that you're going to run it in. Or you're homebrewing and creating your own world, which is in itself uh, a very time-consuming endeavor, depending on how big a scale you want to build it, especially if it's your first time doing it. So for people who are fans of Critical Role and have watched the most recent campaign, this is a world you're already very familiar with, and hopefully would feel more comfortable jumping into and taking the reins on. So this book, for those people, uh, is a place where there's baked-in familiarity, there are locations and factions and tensions and characters and NPCs and, and elements of the world that are already well established based on our current campaign, so you have the opportunity to choose and pick within these spaces that you're already familiar with and comfortable with the idea of running a game in this region, removed from the adventures of our campaign, or connected if you wanted to. Um, so for, for those people, it's, it's an invitation to begin building in a space they're, they're already comfortable with, which is a lot of times the first hurdle for running your first game. For classic players who have no idea about any of the stuff we do, uh, I really wanted this to be a very comprehensive, fun, uh, engaging world in its own right that stands alone, unique from you know other settings, but also doesn't require you to have knowledge of or really care of our show to still be able to dig into, pull apart, make it your own, customize, change, or keep as much as you want and and use you know uh, every every part of the buffalo, if you will, uh, to to what you want to to make your campaign fun and enjoyable. Um, so that, that's, that's my goal with this, is to make it something that anybody could make use of and enjoy. Fantastic, I'm very, very excited. I'm very excited to see like all the other like uh, people starting their own campaigns in your setting all over the world. It, I think that's gonna be sort of amazing, right? Like this idea that like maybe some other people will start streaming and like the world of Exandria will like 
kind of like just kind of spread throughout Twitch because all of these fans are like now now kind of like uh, taking taking on the mantle of being a dungeon master is like yeah very very exciting to me. It's I it's hard to explain the the idea of that and even just people that already have begun running their own campaigns and will approach me at conventions and tell me about you know their version of Exandria and how they're running their home games and how they've changed the story and chosen different points in the timeline. To me, it's it's so exciting, it's exhilarating, and it, it fills me with pride to think that, you know, something that I've created has inspired somebody to then create on top of and make their own and continue to build on. That is, in my opinion, kind of one of the one of the greatest feelings as a creator. I'm not precious with the things. I don't have a, a way it should be run. I don't have an idea that, you know, what I do is how things are supposed to be. There's just how I do things. And I know that I still, there are many things I have to learn and there are many people out there that can do things far better than I can. And it's exciting to see people take something that I started and run with it and make it something even more beautiful and more expansive and exciting than I could have hoped for. And that to me is a huge thrill. So tell me there's a new type of magic in the Explorer's Guide to Wild Mount. Mm -hmm. It's not a school, but it's a new type of magic mm -hmm. that is very unique. Dunamancy. Yeah, D Dunamancy is, um, it's a new family, I guess you could say, of magic. It's not a new school, but it is, it is a collection of spells and a type of, uh, an offshoot of the standard arcane uh, practice that was developed by the Korean dynasty through their worship of, of the Luxon, this, this light entity and the beacons that they began to uncover, which were these, these artifacts of potentiality and kind of, for, for the layman's term scenario, uh, esoteric space-time magic, if you will. Um, and so Dunamancy is a, um, a collection of, of, of magic and a, a, a practice of magic that works around probability and potentiality. The idea that every person that goes through their life, every decision they make, every major choice, every major action that, a, that changes the world around them, that has ripples, a butterfly effect on every other creature around them, the world as they progress through it, um, and choosing their destiny and, and the next timeline that comes to fruition, the vibrating potential of the universe towards that choice itself as an energy. You know, that, that anticipation you feel in a horror movie before you're, you're getting to a major moment that you know that's coming, that type of raising vibration, that is the dunamis that builds to that choice. And so dunamancy is the ability to take that growing, vibrating power of potentiality and crafting it into magic and using it to manipulate the world on its very base core elements. Um, and so you have spells that affect gravity that affect time and its 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 progression and passing the probability of the choices you make to to kind of help nudge and adjust the paths you take in the world to your favor uh, and to the favor of others um, to rip through alternate timelines and dimensions and send physically or mentally creatures through that space um, it's it's a little esoteric it falls definitely in my my long-standing love of you know, physics, astrophysics, metaphysics, quantum physics, all that kind of realm there, and bringing it a little more into the realm of D&D &D fantasy arcane practice. That is going to be very fun. <laughs> <laughs> and that is, that is a type of magic that doesn't... Uh, certainly, there are some spells that are like that in D&D, &D, mm -hmm. but I've always wanted a ton of spells like that in D&D. Yeah. Thematically, uh, haste, slow, time stop, you know, a reverse gravity, these are all spells that fallen in a realm that is, you know, in a similar pocket to what Dunamancy is, but they've pulled from it without knowing what was beyond it. You know, you've dabbled in elements of time magic, but didn't realize that beyond that curtain, there was a whole subsect of magic that focused on these very basic elements of the universe. When you consider, you know, all of creation, you know, water, water is one of the basic elements, but water doesn't exist all over the universe, necessarily, you know. Um, at the core, the very creation of, of the universe as, as we know it and a, 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 a physical level in the real world, you know, gravity, time, uh, these are all things that are absolutely necessary and are ever present in all facets of creation. And so I wanted to kind of expand upon that very, very primal uh, basis of the universe for a lot of these spells and what they manipulate. To, to take it away from the more elemental aspects that the classically D&D magic revolves around. And so that's kind of where the inspiration for Dunamancy came from and where that focus and the theming of the Korean Dynasty's uh, 
you know, religious beliefs are based on. Can you tell me about some of the spells that are in there, specifically? I can tell you about some of the spells in there. I know you can't tell me about all of them. I can't tell you about all of them. <laughs> um, those who are familiar with the, the show may have seen one of our characters, Caleb, has acquired a handful of Dunamancy spells through the adventure. Uh, one of which you'll see in here is Fortune's Favor. Fortune's Favor is a spell that you can cast that creates a, uh, a what's called a fragment of possibility, a moat of condensed dunamis that a person essentially absorbs and keeps around them, and it allows them to adjust a moment of probability in their favor. It essentially gives them the equivalent of a luck point, if you're familiar with the luck feat, but it's a spell-granted uh, uh, luck point that lasts for an hour, if you will. And at higher levels can disseminate amongst multiple targets. And so it gives you the ability to roll an additional d20 uh, for any sort of d20 roll for an attack, for an ability check, for a saving throw, and then choose the better of what's available. Um, there's a spell like Gravity Fisher, which is, you know, we're familiar with the line spells of Lightning Bolt and stuff like that. Imagine a line spell that fired out and before dealing damage, sucked everything within 10 feet of it towards the center if they fail their saving throw, and then crushing them with overwhelming gravitational force. So a lot of these gravity-based spells are not just damage-dealing spells, they also have a, a utility of adjusting and manipulating the battlefield. Very of, controlled. Of slowing things down, holding them in place, of uh, preventing them from leaving a location, from shifting them to a place you want them to be. So you become a little more of like the chess player, controller of the battlefield with a lot of these uh, spells. There's also... Uh, and we get into the higher level stuff, there's uh, Reality Break, which is a spell where you get to actually take a creature uh, and every round they roll to see what type of strange dimensional alteration you thrust them through. Uh, those are familiar with the Confusion spell, it's a similar type at the beginning of every creature's round, you roll a dice to see what happens to them, but it can be anywhere from them being thrown into a, a cosmic horror type alternate Far Realm reality and then spat back out at the end of the round and the terrible things that happened in the meantime. They could all of a sudden have echoes of themselves from other dying realities tearing into this dimension and trying to kill themselves to take their place. You know, so it's, uh, it, it, it's very weird and, and dimension, you know, crossover strangeness, and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. And it's got a cool piece of art in the book, uh, specifically for that spell, <laughs> which very is pretty cool. great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, all sorts of fun fun spells in that realm that I'm excited for people to test out and try. Oh, that, that's such a good narrative hook, too. That's what I like about this this uh, this type of magic, is narratively it, it opens up a, an entire can of worms I always like to play with. Mm -hmm. I love playing with time. I mean, who doesn't want to cast a spell that creates essentially a black hole dark star in the middle of the battlefield that starts sucking everything into oblivion? No one I want to know. Yeah, you thought a sphere of annihilation <laughs> was bad. <laughs> Oh my god, that sounds so fun. I am so excited for this magic. Um, and now we have to wait till March. Uh, I know. It'll go by faster than you think. <laughs> Trust me. Time goes quicker these days. Now we have a couple of subclasses as well. I'm very excited for new subclasses always. I'm excited for everything, let's face it. Uh, but one of those is the Echo Knight. Can you tell me more about the Echo Knight? And yes. What, and what do they serve and how do they serve? So the Echo Knight is a... began as... The, the elite warriors of the Korean dynasty. They, uh, Dunamis classically is a very arcane based power and is manipulated as such. Um, though there are, you know, clerics of, of the Luxon that would be like light domain cleric and such. The Echo Knight is a martial class that has come to manipulate Dunamis in a martial way. And how they do this is in that idea of potentiality and probability that when you make these decisions in a timeline solidifies in the next path of your fate or destiny you've carved goes on, all those possible timelines that weren't chosen die away. Very kind of Langoliers-esque, like the, these, these divergent timelines then just decay and that energy is reabsorbed by the universe. An Echo Knight is able to tap into those dying timelines and temporarily pull a version of themselves from that timeline and use it to fight alongside them. So they can summon an echo of themselves, which is not really them, it's just kind of a shell of what they could have been. Mm -hmm. And on using them on the battlefield to become an extension of themselves. They have the ability to uh, you know, allocate either their, their actions between themselves or the Echo. Um, they can swap spaces with it in certain locations. They can use it to, to defend their allies. They even have the ability to send it long distances focusing on its senses and kind of let it be an extending avatar of themselves. So it's kind of like having its own kind of sh pseudo-shadow clone to, to go into battle alongside them. 
I'm jealous. <laughs> that's a that's a subclass I wish I had designed. <laughs> that sounds so fun. I love I love timey wimey stuff, and I love alternate dimensions and potentiality, and to have like to summon yourself from another potential you to fight with you is uh, just it's such a good narrative hook, and that can go a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, if you're a mischievous dungeon master. Oh yeah, I hope it's fun. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fantastic. So there is a, another subclass that is very cool called the Chronurgist. Tell me a little bit about this. So yeah, in, in the realm of, of time, focus on Dunamancy, and there are many spells that affect time to some degree, uh, the Chronurgist is a, a wizard tradition that focuses on the manipulation of time and the passage of it. Um, you know, many different you know, additions and things have, have walked into the realm of, of time magic and such, and so this is a, a subclass that is focused specifically on that aspect. So imagine a wizard that has the capability, uh, natural instincts that help them speed up in the moment to help their initiative, that they have a feature that can temporarily send an opponent into a moment of, of stasis, freeze time for a moment on you know, an aggressor to kind of set it aside and give the, a reprieve from that entity. Uh, the ability to cast a spell and lock it in a moment in time and hand it to another party member to be released a little point down the road, you know, they themselves like small points of localized time that they have control over um, themselves gives them their edge in the battlefield. So it's very much, you know, they're not, you know, ripping the cosmos apart. Uh, I mean, maybe they can at a higher level, I don't know. But, yeah. uh, but as far as the subclass ability, it's about having those, those abilities beyond spellcraft to adjust, manipulate, and, and take control of small pockets of time's passage in their vicinity and around themselves to their advantage. And how do they do that? And what is this subclass of? It's, it, it's a wizard, right? Like, it's a wizard. It's a wizard yeah. tradition. W wizard who's very good at manipulating the, the passage and flow of time. Why do you like time so much in terms of manipulating it? I feel that there, there are spells that that fall into this category, haste, slow, right. you know, they, all these have our spells that touch on it, but I feel like time is such a, an ever-present factor, you know, every, every adventurer is racing against time to finish their, you know, their, their current goal, uh, you know, <laughs> kingdoms rise and fall and crumble into ruins over a long passage of time. Time is a thing that is ever-present, but isn't really explored as a, a facet of arcane focus on a larger scale where I think like some of the, the, the main schools of course are. Um, so for me it was in the theme of Dunamancy and the Kryn Dynasty's development and trying to to be a little more in control of their destiny to to really see how much of this facet of, of Dunamantic manipulation could really help guide their overall goals. That really was kind of the inspiration for the tradition and why they really put a focus towards this type of arcane practice. Okay, so I'm, that's my new character. <laughs> <laughs> I am going all in on that type of magic. Uh, I cannot wait to manipulate time. <laughs> uh, how often do you get to do that? I mean, it's, and it's got big basis in D&D. &D. I mean, like, there yeah. is a lot of time travel, and especially if you're like looking at Dragonlance. Yeah. Yeah. So people have been fiddling around with time for a while. And almost all of my campaigns are horribly. Uh, I, I've destroyed the timeline multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> people have gone back in the past, met themselves. It's like, it, it's almost like Back to the Future. It's, it's a disaster. But I'm excited <laughs> for this school of magic. It is definitely up my alley. There's another subclass that is another element of, of Dunamancy, which is the Graviturgist. And I can immediately understand what that's all about. Like, I, I expect this is the manipulation uh, of gravity around everything in the material plane and, yeah. and such. Can tell me, tell me how this is interesting and effective. So, Graviter just deals with the the density and placement of the forces of gravity in the battlefield. Um, you know, there are spells that that you know focus and, and touch on elements here, but there are many within Dunamancy that intentionally. Uh, are built around the idea of gravity manipulation. The Graviturgist has focused on this to where they have abilities to alter the density and gravity affecting individual creatures, including themselves, where they can uh, make creatures move slower, so they choose, or be able to jump further, move faster um, at the cost of you know, their strength and density behind the forces they exalt. So like, 
they have the ability to to focus on adjusting that within a single creature and all sorts of facets and 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 uh, challenges that might come across their way. They can focus through the use of their spells and magic to push things, kind of gravity well creatures around the battlefield to help control and essentially kind of chess piece things to where they want them to be to be most effectively assaulted by them and their allies as the battle progresses. Um, they have uh, abilities that uh, can increase the velocity of an associate's attack. You know, in Vision, weapons and swords and such are, are painful when they slash based on the strength of their physical you know, attack. What if that attack was helped along with a sudden surge of gravitational pull towards their target? Um, and then there's the idea of just becoming a singularity of gravitational force that crushes and holds down everything around them for a period of time. So uh, eventually advancing to become a, a force of the universe in the center of the battlefield. We've also got some very, very powerful magical artifacts which you've talked about before. What are these? And how do they play into this campaign? So the Vestiges of Divergence are powerful artifacts that were constructed during the the battles leading into the Calamity, which is the end of the Age of Arcanum, the age before the one that currently happens in the campaign guide. Um, this is a time where the gods walked on the prime material plane. Uh, you know, great cities of majocracies uh, plotted against each other and divinity. This was a time of, of extremely high-end magic power and conflict and warfare that tore across the surface of Exandria. And when this war was finally finished and the betrayer gods were banished to the distant realms, there was the realization from the divine that our presence here is a threat to all of our creation. And so they actually abstained from being part of the world of man and, and all mortals around them. And that was called the divergence, where they, they separated from the world they had helped bring life to. Um, the vestiges are the artifacts of their champions and powerful warriors of these final battles that were just lost to time. Um, and these artifacts embodied an element of the divinity that created them, or the mages who had forged them to fight on, for their interests. And as they were lost to time, they began to lose their power and eventually go dormant. A dormant vestige is a decent magical artifact in its own right, but the idea is as the person who wields it, who is carrying this object with them, begins to grow as an adventurer, as they begin to find themselves, as they begin to be inspired by the, the passions or the, the vengeance they carry, they watch this item grow with them. And the, the item can awaken in three different stages. There's the, the dormant stage, the awakened stage, and there's the exalted stage. And each time the item gets more powerful benefits, gains additional properties, and essentially be, becomes an object that the character can carry with them throughout their adventure and becomes one of kind of their defining characteristics. This object, this magical item, becomes a character in its own right as part of their overall uh, persona. Um, the thing about the, the vestiges is not all of them were made by good gods. And in fact, in this book, a lot of the focus is more on what the betrayer god creations were as well. So a lot of these artifacts sit in the realm of Asmodeus, sit in the realm of uh, you know, Grumsh and other darker deities out there. Previously in other things in Critical Role, we've seen uh, you know, the, the more player-friendly positive ones. <laughs> Here you get to possibly introduce these either for villains to use or for players to wrestle with and see if they can bend to their will. I just want to play one. Well, there's that too. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it a playable race. <laughs> hey, fine! Yeah, uh, I'm sure everyone will be fine with that. Yeah, I'll make a change real fast. It's already in print. We'll make it work. Yeah, I mean, well... <laughs> Down so the road. A leaflet that can fit in the book. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Last man, <laughs> last man change. There are a lot of monsters, and I love monsters. I would argue that monsters helped define D&D, because if you were a player, like, even growing up when I played D&D, &D, you know, I read the player's handbook over and over again, but the, the monster manual is literally just a, you move from page to page, and it's adventure of adventure potential. Mm -hmm. You see these amazing drawings, you see these crazy descriptions. Uh, tell me about these new monsters that are included in the book. No, that's exactly right. The, the monster manual was what first got me into D&D. &D. Before I played any games, I had that book, and I just read through it for all the pictures and the lore about different creatures. You know, I was, I was obsessed with cryptozoology and mythological beasts as a kid, and so it was just an easy ascension for me to, to start reading that and get obsessed. 
Um, in this, it was trying to uh, to find creatures uh, that fit within this new realm of, of Wild Mount and Exandria, that fit within its its you know, topography, that fit within its cultures, that fit within the the dangers and uh, kind of residual challenges from the calamity that happened in Jorhas, which was where the final battle of the calamity took place at the end of the Age of Arcanum. Uh, and so in this we have a number of new uh, fiendish entities that have since taken root since those final battles and now are the natural denizens of the, the broken wastes of Jorhas that include like the Udak, which is this four-armed, hulking, gorilla-like demon beast that just kind of hunts the waste for what it can find or scavenge. And some of which have been uh, bent to become large warfare or beasts of burden for the Kryn dynasty on that side of the continent. We go into like this Wavain Basilisk, which is a, a, a serpentine sea creature that uh, it's got its name from the fact that it, it excretes an oil that can turn things to stone, which is part of its means of eating whatever it can wrap itself around. So a variation on the classic Basilisk, but more for nautical adventures or things that are, you know, ocean centric. Mm. Um, we have uh, a bunch of creatures that are based in some of these older uh, societies and civilizations during the Age of Arcanum that have vanished over time. So in some of these deep, buried ruins, uh, specifically in the northern realm of Isilcross, in the biting north region of the continent, where one of these great floating cities uh, crashed into the frozen Northland, uh, elements left over experiments, great terrible arcane experiments from the society still remain, uh, living off of their final conditioning and programming before their creators vanished, and as such become a huge challenge and barrier for anyone who wishes to reap the rewards from what can still be scavenged from those ruins. Um, all manner of creatures in that realm and beyond. Uh, some you'll recognize from Campaign 2, and some are custom created for the world, you know, that we've expanded upon in this book. So there are several adventures that are contained within this book to get people started and, and take their first steps into the world of critical role. Mm -hmm. Tell me about those. So uh, we wanted to create adventures that were useful for anybody across the spectrum of experience, you know, and a, a seasoned dungeon master could take these adventures and go, oh, perfect, this, 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 this will work and dive right in and make it their own. But we also wanted to make sure that for anybody who this is their first time wanting to run a game, to run an adventure, they could pick it up and it breaks down exactly how it's meant to be read, consumed, and run, uh, as, as well as giving anecdotes to suggest ways that they can make it their own, customize it, and not feel like they're glued to what's present in this. Very much kind of a, an introductory element to running your own game. And so each of these four adventures is located in one of the four major regions of the continent. We have one in the Menagerie Coast, which is a little more of a, um, a seafaring, coastal, uh, flavored type adventure uh, that w would behoove you if you wanted to run a campaign that dealt more with you know, ships in the high seas and uh, the, the cultures of the Clovis Concord. There's one adventure that takes place in uh, Western Winandir, which is where the Dwendalian Empire resides. And this one ties in with the, uh, the city of Hupperduke and uh, more the, the potential of, of the politics there as well as the people of the Empire. And in this one specifically, some of the unhappy individuals that may have machinations against their political frustrations they've encountered in that region. We have one that takes place in Eastern Winandir, which is where Jorhas is and where the Kryn dynasty is. And this one ties more into the current war conflict. It's kind of one of the larger overall themes of the book, where you uh, are part of a, a military initiative pushing westward towards a possible conflict with the, uh, the Empire, the Dominion Empire, and s trying to find a way to deal with a rogue, unexpected element that's caused a complication with that journey. And then we have a fourth one that is the Biting North, which is the northern part of the continent and the frozen islands of Isocross beyond there that deals more with the, the unknown and the mystery of what's being uncovered under the ice up there and kind of the arms race of all these different factions that are uh, racing each other northward to reap whatever can be found in this region before the others can. Uh, and a complication arises as part of that adventure as well. So the idea is you can choose any major part of this continent to begin your campaign with any of these adventures and then go from there. We want it to be an easy to, to consume, easy to run, introduction 
for anybody, no matter where you wanted to start an adventure in this book? You've been playing D and D for you said twenty four years. Twenty four years, yeah. What does it feel like now, after having been a player for that long, having created so many adventures as a dungeon master and created a a TV series um, on Twitch where you and your friends are playing, where you never thought this was going to happen, no. and now you have an animated series that is going to be on television, and now you are officially part of the thing you are a fan of, like your universe is a D&D universe now. Like you have been brought into the fold. What is this like for you? Uh, I'm still processing. Okay. It's <laughs> you can get back to me. No, no, I mean it's it's overwhelming. Yeah. It's it's incredible. It's intimidating. Uh, I'm I'm thankful and proud. And I'm just genuinely hoping to to make people happy. That's the basis of it all. Like it's it's not even like a, a, a point of pride of like I created something. I'm I'm extremely honored that people uh from Wizards, you know, reached out and took a chance on wanting to invite me in and collaborate with me on this. Um and as a a, a genuinely insecure person, there's you know, always a consistent level of self guessing yourself. Um, second guessing yourself. So, more than anything, I'm I'm excited to hear how people enjoy it and how they take it and run with it. And uh, to to think that I'm part of something that was so important to me growing up is just <sighs> very grateful. Very grateful. I I feel like this book fills a niche that only like. I mean, like the massive fans of D and D have been looking for, the fact that I get to have time magic and the fact that I can like manipulate things around, using gravity, or use the potential of uh, a character that exists in another timeline to help me temporarily, are all things like I, I just kind of fantasize about mm -hmm. and have existed in books and films and television before, but D and D's never had this type of magic. And I feel like this book is adding so much to the world of D&D. I feel like this is a core D&D book to me, like a core setting. Just from the immediate reading of it. Like, I, I, I'm not good at lying. I'm very excited for this book. This is, like, Thank really, you. really, really cool. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm very happy for you, but also, it's really a good book. It is a solid piece of work. Thank you very much. Um, so, I, uh, I'm very... I think people are going to... Go crazy for it. I think it's going to be an amazing book. I, I hope people like it. <laughs> yeah. Matt, thank you so much for your time. I'm so incredibly excited for the book, and I'm very excited for you. I think uh, it, it's fantastic to know that you are now like one of the stewards of D&D &D and that your universe is now part of it. That's surreal. I'm, I'm very thankful for everyone at Wizards for giving me the opportunity. I'm thankful for the incredible uh, collaboration from all the writers that contributed to this book. And uh, I really hope... I hope all you guys enjoy it. I'm, I'm really excited about it. I hope you are too. Pre-order now on dndbeyond.com and receive exclusive bonus content with everything that you need to start your own adventure.